the craze of the smart home, an ever so fast growing market with voice recognition tools, thermostats, smoke alarms, speakers, you name it. Becoming connected is one of the biggest and hottest trends across the world today. As a matter of fact, the global home automation market size, it's actually increasing at a significantly fast rate, estimated to reach $114 billion by 2025. Though this doesn't come without its own problems. There's companies out there like Sonos, for example, that have decided they're gonna end support for some of the older hardware. As a result, people that had connected devices using these Sonos devices will no longer be able to use them. It's these kind of business decisions by these large corporations that sometimes hurt the smart market and give it a bad name. And this often forces me to decide and make that comparison between building and buying. And so for my focus today is really gonna be about how I replace this Chamberlain garage door I have with something a little bit more makeshift that I made, which is this little guy over here. Now, right now it doesn't look like it's clean and tidy. I'm gonna build a 3D printed enclosure for this eventually, but for now I just wanted to test it out to make sure that it would actually work. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna follow these wires and I'm gonna show you that this one actually connects all the way down to the door sensor, which is gonna show us whether or not the door is open or closed right over there. And then when I follow the other wires, which are the red and the black wires, you notice that those actually terminate back up to the garage. And sorry for the Blair Witch Project kind of shot here. But that's what we're going to be working with. And now it comes time to analyze this stuff. And that is really look at the cost of building this versus the cost of actually buying it. We're going to walk through a build versus buy analysis. And I will eventually focus on the garage or opener. But some of these things I'm going to walk through is a little bit more generic. So let's get into it. And when I do that, I generally look at a few categories. Impact the business decision, security, customization, reliability, setup, and of course, cost. Now I just talked to you about the actual incident with Sonos where they decided to discontinue some of their older devices and as a result, customers are going to be left without support. So when it comes to impact of business decisions, I give the point to actually building your own because you're in complete control of whether or not you want to continue using that service or not. Tomorrow, if some of your smart home automation providers actually say that they're going to stop any kind of service levels, well then that device is pretty much dumb. The next thing I look at is security. And as you're gonna see through the demonstration that I'm gonna walk you through, I've actually built my own two-factor security into my application. Kevin, does two-factor authentication help? Oh, absolutely. Enabling two-step authentication or two-factor uh, definitely raises the bar significantly and should be done. And furthermore, in the future, I'm actually gonna be adding some machine learning with some computer vision so that it's actually gonna have some facial recognition built in as well. So the security and how secure it is is gonna be under my control. I would actually say that if you buy a smart home automation tool, it really depends on the organization you're buying it from. Some of them actually have something like two-factor authentication and some of them that actually have it don't even advertise it well enough. And there's other organizations that don't have it at this point as well. So that's a little bit scary in terms of security. You need to do some research on the actual smart home device that you're gonna be buying because it's gonna heavily depend on you know their business practices as to whether or not security is taken safely or not. The other thing to keep in mind is that when you actually have your credentials, they're actually posted into the cloud. And sometimes when these organizations have these large security breaches, in certain cases, 2 billion records stolen in 2019, that exposes you and anything that you have connected in your house. So the minute they actually get your credentials, they can start controlling things in your house, which is kind of scary as well. Next is customization. I love the fact that I can do anything I want because I built uh, a lot of the back end in Python and the front end is primarily Flask based, which I will be moving over to Django eventually. But the fact that I can integrate this within my own home automation framework is kind of awesome. I do use Home Assistant. I'm not part of the cloud service, so I do all of the automations in-house myself. Whereas when you look at a tool that's bought from outside, they have a very closed ecosystem, and that's because they want to contain all of the smart home devices within their own ecosystem. Look at Nest, for example, where Nest used to allow you to integrate with with other smart home automation frameworks, but some of that capability has been taken away. And they're actually expanding their offering within Nest now with thermostats, Nest Protect, and the cameras and all that other kind of fun stuff. So they, it's a really closed ecosystem. And like I said, some of them you can work around, but you may be compromising yourself on a security standpoint. I find from a reliability standpoint, when you build your own, there's just so much more flexibility, but at the same time, it's much more reliable. It just works. For example, when you look at the MyQ, 
device that I'm actually looking to replace, I always have to go back and replace the batteries. And if I don't replace the batteries, the garage door just doesn't work. It also depends on some kind of a wireless connection as well. Whereas when I build it myself, I don't need to worry about it because everything is hardwired into the actual garage door. And so from that standpoint, I'm good. When I look at the reliability of some of these home automation tools, they're not bad. I mean, some of them work quite well, though again, in certain cases, you may have to go back and, you know, refresh batteries because it's going to stop working. And in my specific example, I'm talking about my garage door opener because that's what this video is going to be about. Setup, however, when you're building your own, it can be quite difficult. If you're not somewhat technical, but at the same time, somewhat of a handy person, it may be hard to set things up. You actually have to go into your garage door opener and hardwire certain wires in. You have to build the actual code. You have to deploy it to the actual chip, and then you have to set it up to a relay and then connect that to your garage door. Sounds like a daunting task, but I promise you it's actually not that bad. A lot of the code is available online that you can flash to your chip. In this case, I use an ESP8266, and then connecting it is somewhat very easy. The one you buy, Generally speaking, they thrive on setup and ease of use. So, you know, that's where customer satisfaction comes in. So for them, they want to make sure that whatever they bring into your home is very easy to set up and very few barriers of entry to any kind of person, whether you're technical or not. Cost, on the other hand, is a different question. So as things start becoming a little bit more cheaper and people start getting more into DIY, it just becomes a lot more cost effective to actually build your own. For example, the garage door opener that I'm actually replacing, my MyQ garage door, I have two different garage doors. Each of those little remotes costs around $50 that you put on your garage door. You only have to buy one extra because one already comes with the, t with the unit. And then the unit itself is about $100 to $125, depending on where you live. So you're looking at anywhere between $150 to you know almost $200 after taxes. The cost for me to build the same thing for my garage door openers for both is about $40. Maybe not even that much. Maybe actually a little bit less than that. The relays themselves you can get off of eBay for a couple of dollars. The chips you can get for a couple of dollars. Really where you're going to be spending some money is actually on the wire. And I just bought my wire off of Amazon. But setting all this stuff up is actually relatively cost effective. And if you actually buy it from eBay, you may even save a little bit more money as well. And so this is just becoming the norm. So for someone like me, this is how I would do the assessment of whether I'm going to build or buy. And clearly in my case, the way I've ranked these, it makes more sense for me to build it. So let me show you how it works now. So the first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to set it up as a like a web application on my actual phone. One of the first things I check is, okay, both doors are actually closed. So let me make sure that I have some air checks built in. I'm going to try hitting the first one and it says door is already closed. And the second one also says door is already closed. So from that standpoint, my air checks are working. If I hit open, it's actually going to say not authenticated. Same with the top one. And the whole purpose is you need to have your code put in. So right now I'm going to let this expire out, copy and paste this actual code, put it back in one of my garage doors, and let's see what happens here. I'm going to paste it in and finally hit open. And as you can see, the door is open and the little sign on the right hand side actually shows a symbol for the garage door being open. Also, it displays on the bottom that the door is open. So now let me go ahead and actually close it. And it says door closing. Oh, and sorry, you're gonna have to excuse me. I'm trying to do this with one hand. So let's go to the other door now. So I'm gonna do the same thing with my other garage door. Go ahead, pop in the code. And finally, it's gonna go ahead and open that door as well. Notice how it, after I open it, it actually shows that it's authenticated. Before, remember it showed not authenticated. So I have a little green symbol there that shows authenticated every single time the proper code is put in. If you were to put in some random code, it's actually going to show not authenticated. And of course, I forgot to capture this. And that is what happens if you actually enter the wrong code. So in the first one, you see it actually says not authenticated. And in the second one, it actually also shows that it's not authenticated. In a second, you'll see that. Now, if you're curious to see how this entire system works and the code and you know everything that went into it, I'm actually going to link up one of my previous videos where I actually did a walkthrough of how the system works in the back end. I showed you how and when the relay actually goes off and all of this stuff with authenticated, non-authenticated and all that other kind of stuff. I actually walk you through a demonstration of how that actually works with the relay. So be sure to check that out if you want to learn a little bit more. Now I'm going to close this again. 
So this whole thing was deployed on a temporary Raspberry Pi. I'm eventually gonna put this more in a production Pi and actually change the IP and completely mask the application so that nothing shows. And again, you can see it says door is closed. So that in a nutshell is how this application works with two-factor authentication. Now, in addition to using tools like two-factor authentication, there's other things you can do to ramp up some of the security for you. First of all, check online whether your email has been compromised or not. There's many websites that allow you to do this, and you can actually check to see whether your email and any passwords have ever been compromised. The website that I actually recommend is called Have I Been Pawned. You just go ahead and you type in your email. So we'll type in johnsmith at gmail.com. And what it'll do is it'll go through all of the actual breaches that have happened over the last couple of years and it'll tell you how many times your password has been breached or this email has been compromised. And it gives you some more details about it. So go ahead and check this out. This is a great way to see whether or not your email has been compromised or not. Second, update to safe and secure passwords. Make them at least eight characters long. Use letters, numbers, and special characters and if you can, try to change it out every couple of months. Third, and sort of the theme for this video, turn on two-factor or multi-factor authentication for your emails and any smart home services that actually offer it. Trust me, it's a lifesaver and it's worth it. Now, whenever you're gonna be accessing some of these services over public Wi-Fi, make sure that you protect yourself with a VPN because you wanna to try to prevent things like man in the middle attacks or any kind of phishing attempts. The service that I always recommend is NordVPN. Again, I've been using them for several years, an amazing service, fast service as well. Check down below for a link on how to get started. And last, if you feel that your privacy may have been compromised, make sure you talk to somebody. Contact either the authorities, the organization that you're concerned with, or any other escalation point that you're aware of. The last thing you wanna do is be nonchalant about it and just let it roll off your shoulders because sometimes it just may be too late. And that folks is a wrap for this video. Now, if you found this content helpful, please consider liking, subscribing. Also add some comments down below to let me know what else you'd like to see. Until then, be safe and see you next time. Bye-bye.